to um, see if we can get the fire marshal up, um, ask him some questions about capacity. Is he here? Yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what's wrong, it's on. Get closer. Get closer. Get closer. Talk into the mic. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Just want to get the fire marshal up to talk about capacity. Good evening or afternoon. Good afternoon. Frank Skates, fire marshal of what was, uh, I'd like to, maybe you could talk about what the capacity was maybe before and after the new deck uh, from when you were there. When Jack Baker's had without the addition. I can't. <laughs> when Jack Baker's had it, it was 396, I believe. Uh, they, when the last inspection, my guys went out. Part of the building had been shut down, and I, I believe they included the deck, but I'm not sure. The whole, the entire building and everything would have been 372. Okay, that's with the additional deck? The note on the uh, computer that we use, the program, it said deck, square footage, I, dot, 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 and it didn't go any further. I don't know if there was a problem with the computer or what. Um, I don't know if it meant inclusive or, or something else. Okay. Okay. I'll wait for other discussion. Any other discussion? Jeez, I got, I got to tell you. <laughs> Folks, we have a computer up here, I, uh, and it shows the, the SCG TV screen. <laughs> and every time I look down, I think, who's that guy in the middle with no hair? <laughs> That's I, haven't, I haven't gotten used to it yet. It's because, it's because of the glare. The glare is coming back at it. <laughs> okay, discussion. No other discussion? I'll discuss. Commissioner Isnardi. Um, first, let me say, you know, I was at other appointments, so I had um, my director of community affairs meet with some folks at Mon Mongolia Bay. And I had some questions because I had reviewed this issue before in the past. So I, I called um, Kim Rosenka, who's representative for um, Banana River. Um, this is a very difficult situation because I, I feel if I live there, I wouldn't like the noise either. But I understand where Mr. Underhill is coming from because it is a restaurant and it does have a right to be open. I mean, we do have noise ordinances in place. And I have to believe that. The mere fact that if, and if you're correct, sir, if there hasn't been any noise complaints, I know for five, six weeks, that's a long time. If he's willing to, to take those additional noise restrictions as part of the mediation agreement, I would say that, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see him being willing to pay $5,000 on a third offense. So, I mean, I, I, I say that I'm, I am at least am where I would give them the benefit of the doubt and allow him to try to operate because that seems to be other than people being angry that he didn't properly permit it in the beginning which I've had residents not properly permit fences and deckings in their own homes um, whether he should have known better or not you know it's for you to judge but I think that we ought to at least give it a chance I mean we can we can continue and they can appeal to the magistrate and we can drag this on further but I think the one common theme was noise and if that is addressed I, I don't see how this could be a bad thing. I mean, it is riverfront property. It is a good mixed use. I know that there are residents that express that they would like, a, at least by email, a chart house style restaurant. Well, you know, that's up to the owner to decide what kind of restaurant he wants to operate. Um, I mean, I could address several other points too, but you know, in the trying to be conscientious of, a, of how much time all of you have been. And I do appreciate that. And I do understand where you're coming from. And I have neighbors, too, that every weekend, and I could call code enforcement, but it makes it a little awkward when your husband is the deputy city manager in the city you live in. So, I mean, I, I feel bad for you guys. I really do as far as your concerns. But I think Mr. Underhill is more than compromised with this mediation agreement. I think that, you know, I think he's, it's a little above and beyond what even is necessary for the average restaurant. 
Commissioner Tobai, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to first of all thank everyone on both on both sides for showing up. I think that, uh, that that's wonderful that you're getting in, involved, uh, no matter which side of the issue that that you're on. And uh, I, I, I want to specifically thank the uh, residents of Magnolia Bay that called my office uh, on numerous occasions and uh, were able to show up and uh, express their concerns very vividly and 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 clearly. Um, I, d I don't know if, and in fact, I don't think this is the quasi-judicial uh, uh, forum that we have in planning and zoning, but I'm going to disclose nonetheless. Uh, Mr. Underhill mentioned that uh, he has a property that sits closer to another uh, condo than what even Magnolia Bay is, and uh, that's the Pineapple House. And I don't know about upscale, but uh, they allowed me to live there, and I owned a uh, condo there for the better part of three years. And there were some concerns. And uh, in f Mr. Under handle handled them. Uh, probably they should not have gotten it to where they were, but there were parking issues, and there were noise issues, and they were taken care of. And I know this because I was an elected official at the time, and people quickly got off that subject and wanted me to outlaw motorcycles because motorcycles were the largest issue uh, uh, of the residents there. And what I admire about uh, Mr. Underhill uh, when he came up here was he, he said that he'd made mistakes. Very rarely do you ever get someone up to a microphone and said, we, there were some problems and I am responsible for those problems and I want to go about fixing them. But I want to be very clear that I did uh, read pretty specifically this mediation document. And after the third violation, it comes back to the board. And uh, I want to be very, very, very clear that should it come to that, that it will be my recommendation, especially for all the work that uh, Magnolia Bay has done to uh, meet with us and discuss their issues, uh, that there will be no music out on the deck. I don't think that that's anything um, that residents should have to fight for, have a promise from a uh, business owner, that promise be broken, and uh, then come have to fight. So I would hope, should uh, we go through with this mediation agreement, that you hear from uh, other commissioners that should uh, Mr. Underhill violate uh, this mediation agreement and it eventually end up with a board that we uh, immediately and unequivocally revoke his right to uh, have any type of venue out on, on the river. But I, I think, uh, you know, I need to give him the benefit of the doubt at this juncture because in my one previous experience with him, uh, he, he made good on his uh, promises. And uh, so I, I will be voting uh, in favor of this. But nonetheless, um, I hope to hear, continue to hear from the Magnolia Bay residents, be it my district or not. Uh, firsthand if these violations uh, uh, should continue. Commissioner Barfield. Yes, uh, Commissioner Smith and I were on this board when all this came forward. And I think you need to understand a little bit of what the background is. First off, there's been a restaurant there, from, as far as I can remember, probably to the, to the 80s at least. And uh, then when Jack Baker's Lobster Shanty, when uh, he, he bought the place and uh, did some work to it then, while he was there, the possibility of selling uh, to residential, so he had the zoning changed to residential, and they had a non-conforming use um, CUP there, continuing use permit. So, but any change that would ever happen over an increase on, of, of the size, w the zoning would have to be changed back to commercial. So that's what, where it all started. Now, the other thing to understand is where 
where the restaurant is, all the other properties around are residential, uh, either uh, condo or just regular residential. So what that means is the whole area, it's really, it's incompatible to make it bigger because the whole area is residential from a zoning perspective. So the zoning request, uh, there was a zoning request and of course then the, the, the CUP and then a comp plan, all that was denied, we denied that. So we, we figured it was over, but the point is this, it didn't change, all we, and we voted to turn that back to the restaurant it was. You can still have music, you can still have a restaurant, you can still do all of that. It was no change from what it was in, in Jack Baker's. Now you can do some modifications, some you know, some things within that, but that was it. Because it fit in, so far it fit in well with the residential classifications all around. So we didn't vote to put him out of business. We didn't vote, none of our decisions have ever been that. In fact, all we did was to say, listen, it's fine, we want it there. You hear the residents talk about how they want that restaurant there. So that's all this was. There was a gentleman, I don't remember who got up and spoke, and he says, you know, uh, really worried about the precedent this sets. Um, and basically what he said is we're legalizing what is illegal. And that's, that's the point. We have followed the law on this. We followed it by the letter. And to do this sets a huge precedent. And, you know, I'm a business owner too. I understand all this. But you know what? You still have to play within the rules. As Mr. Bogger said, we have to stay within the rules. So it's a tough situation here because we don't want businesses to fail. We don't, we, tourism is a big, a, a big effort here. And, you know, and we have not stopped him from working. We have not stopped any of that. All that we say is it has to go back to the way it was. So I, I'm opposed to this mediation agreement. If it wants to go further to the magistrate, that's fine. But I'm gonna put the motion out there that says we deny this mediation agreement because, because of the fact that you know, he still can work, and we've done everything according to the law. And that's my motion. Commissioner Pritchett. Yeah, um, I got a little confused when we were talking about capacity. Is the capacity less now with the deck being built, being occupied, than it was when it was the <coughs> lobster shanty? Part of the building was... Um, they had tables and chairs just stacked up and they weren't using it anymore. That, that's one of the reasons that it went down. Uh, as I said, I cannot guarantee that the, they did the deck at the time when back in March. Uh, I've heard two figures today. One uh, from Ms. Rzinka, I believe, sent someone an email and said there was taking out, square footage is done on net, not gross area. So taking out the bar, taking out poles, taking out whatever, there was 600 square foot less. That would be 40 people, because um, 15 square feet per person is, is a less concentrated use. If you just use the, the total figures that someone else put out here, 4,100 square feet, you're looking at 270 people. So without looking at the site plan or plans, I, I can't say for sure what the uh, actual true occupant load would be okay thank you for that um, I I read through the mediation and this is this is hard I mean if, if things would have done the way they should we wouldn't have to be here so it's a little bit frustrating uh, trying to figure this out and I, I watched it for the year before I got on the Commission and um, there's a there's a lot of you know value on both sides of what I'm hearing I, I am pro-business you know, I, I believe very much in getting business back in. We've had economic problems, but I know it's our responsibility to also protect residents because we're all you got. You know, it comes down with that. So um, a couple things that I'm concerned with this is, is adequate parking. You know, I've heard y'all talk about that. And I, the noise and um, ADA compliancy. Stormwater is a big deal with me. We just gave ourselves a $32 million uh, tax to, to protect the river so we have to deal with all these things and, and they might be adequately done in the agreement here and, and one thing I do like about the agreement is if the permitting doesn't go through it doesn't open and I think there's a good chance part of that's going to have to get ripped up anyways to, to do some of these things that have to be done 
Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling with this. I, I've kind of waited on both sides here. I do agree that if we did happen to go through with this, um, with Commissioner Tobias stands, if, if there was any more problem with sound, just, you know, we've got to figure out a way to make no music at all on the deck. I mean, just to protect your rights. Um, because of the fact that, that I'm struggling, um, I, th I think I'm going to have to um, vote in, uh, with um, the commissioner of the district, um, Mr. Barfield. Barfield. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. A little slow. A little it's just tough when you have to do that off the top of your head, right? <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Especially since I can't remember who you are anymore now. I, I think that's what I'm going to have to do is because if it was my district, I would have put in the extra um, energy into it because, you know, he has to live with y'all. And so I, I think that's what I, I'm going to, I'm going to um, support Commissioner Barfield. But um, I, this is, this is really hard because I, I really do like Buzz and, um, and I, I like the project. I really wish before we got here that the project would have sat down with the community and you guys would have come to terms and come in happy and, and the mediation would be between that and what we have to do to get the permitting problem where it needs to be. But there's so many things that got to be right in a business, especially with that many people there. It's got to be safe. And we can't risk anybody's um, safety out there in those types of businesses. So that's where I am on this. And this is probably, I think, one of the hardest things that I've had to do in my few months here. So thank you for all your input and time. Commissioner Znardi. I just want to make mention, and I'm not saying that there, you know, is any ill will by this statement, but what came before this commission before was a rezoning of this area, and that's not what's being asked for today. And also, again, if, if this is working next to Pineapple House, I just, you know, I, I the onus is on the, the business to, to not have the noise, and the noise seems to be the number one issue. So for me, again, I, I would just stress that the items before the commission of past, and we are a new commission, and as you know and as we both served, if you, you can have a commission or a council do something completely different than a previous. That's why we're elected, either to replace what was there or to bring something new to the table. So again, the onus is on the business holder to do the right thing. And if he doesn't, I, I don't think he wants to pay those fines. And I know that we would hear from every single one of the residents that are in this room. So I think by not affording him the chance, again, this is not a rezoning. This is a just, this is for use of the property with the deck. So it's a different issue. Because I think the reason, the reason why I stress that, in my mind is like I've been here way too long. The reason why I stress that is that a lot of the concern when the rezoning was before this board before was big hotels coming up, was big things coming into this nice, these nice quiet area. So I know that that was a huge issue for many people um, of Magnolia Bay. But anyway, I'm done. I'm sorry. Oops. Commissioner Pritchett. Is there, any, I, I don't know if this is in our ability to do it. Is there any way to get Magnolia Bay and the other people that own property with the owner and, and come together and, and get some kind of comfort agreement? I, I, I think if, if we could do that, it would make the job we're doing up here so much easier. So I, I would really encourage that. I, I think there's an ability to do it because I'm, I'm hearing you, you everybody would, would enjoy this type of venue, but you feel like you got burnt a little. And I, I think Mr. Underhill would like to make that um, a priority so that doesn't happen. So I think if you guys could find a way to get together, and I don't, I don't know how to um, embrace that for you, but I think it would make what we're trying to do up here a lot easier. My turn. Okay, I had uh, the pleasure of meeting with the Magnolia folks several times. Um, heard their comments, heard their complaints, acknowledged them, agree with some of them, most of them. I too live on water and I have a restaurant that's probably not 500 feet away and they could be quite loud also. What we wound up doing with them was they agreed to restrict their 
band playing to Friday evenings from 6 to 9. Saturdays, I think it's 12 to 10. And on Sundays, it's, I think it's 2 to 6 or 12 to 6. And it's worked out fine. During those times, I can, my neighbors can live with the fact that the, there's music. I've also met with um, Kim Merzanka and Buzz Underhill several times. They were in my office most recently discussing the mediation agreement. I had Scott Knox in my office speaking about it. I wasn't happy about the mediation agreement simply because I didn't understand what the law was. I didn't understand the provision that that was available to uh, the complainants. After that was explained to me, I understand that that went on, but I, I can tell you that my initial reaction was that who authorized the attorney to negotiate anything on our behalf. The commission was unaware of it. I was blindsided. I had no idea this was going on. But after I found the and discovered all the parameters that were involved, I understand that it's perfectly legal and it's within the rights of the county and the complainant. So looking at the agreement itself, I agree with Mr. Bogger. He's not here now. But we have to find a way to split this baby because it's important. It's important to the community, the folks that live there. It's important to the business community. I think this agreement does split that baby pretty well. I think the times are limited for the music. I think that's the biggest complaint. It's, the complaint is not that there's going to be music. I mean that there's going to be food served there or there's people coming and going. I think the big complaint is the music and the type of people it attracts. I'm sure Mr. Underhill is aware of that. He's spoken to me about that. Um, and the fines that are there hanging over his head are like, um, what is it, Damocles sword? Is that something like that? Going back to my Greek 50 years ago when I was in college. Was it that long ago? Wow. Um, so, Having said that, I think I would, I, not think, I'm, I'm going to rule in favor of Mr. Underhill and his undertaking. I think this, this works well for everybody. I think the folks in Magnolia Bay uh, will come to see that it's not that big a deal. I think that they can live with this. If they can't, they have the resources. Uh, Mr. Underhill has the, the threat of $5,000 fines, and you can always come back to us. And... Obviously, from the comments I've heard up here, we're sympathetic to you. So I think this, this splits the baby as, as best we can. So um, that's my two cents worth. So we have a motion on the board to deny this from Commissioner Barfield. And you, had a, you seconded that. Second. And we have a second by Commissioner Pritchett. And so let me just ask the county attorney, if we, if we vote for this, what does that exactly do? Vote for the motion. You'd we, be with denying, the motion to deny. Yeah, you'd be denying the. Uh, right. Okay. So then, where where does that put? Well, Mr. theoretically, Andrew. it goes back to the special magistrate, but there's also now a suit file that would address the the uh, comprehensive plan issue, right. and we would have to respond in that suit. So one of we could respond in a couple of ways, but one of which would be to counterclaim to have the illegally create uh, constructed. Uh, roof and deck to be removed uh, to restoration of the property, the condition it was back in 2015. And uh, the other option, uh, which I don't know what we can get to unless we get the comp plan issue involved, re <coughs> resolved rather, is the uh, special magistrate gets to finish the process of having a hearing in front of her, which she will come back and give you a recommendation as to what she thinks. Okay. So the way I see that is that, again, we're traveling down a road that really nobody's, nobody's going to win. Nobody's gonna, going to benefit. Um, okay, so we have the motion. You guys have heard all the there is to hear. I'm a little unclear about the, the lawsuit on the uh, comp plan. Uh, what's the implications as far as that's related to this? I don't well, think it's not clear. Uh, the, the, I assume, I haven't read it because I just got it on my desk this morning when I walked in. So, the, I think what they're challenging is the denial of the comp plan amendment. 
and that would be a fairly debatable standard, meaning that the, if there's any reasonable basis for having taken the decision that the board made when it denied it, then it's okay. So that issue will be coming up uh, as part of a lawsuit, whether or not it was reasonable for the board to do what it did, which I think it, you know, I think our position would be it was. Um, but as part of that, we would probably be required to file as a mandatory counterclaim the, the claim to declare a violation of the, uh, the decking, the roof, and the, the small retention area that they have now filled in with sand. And we'd have to get that all put back to where it was in 2015 when the board approved the site plan that was uh, originally the, the basis for non-conforming use. So that's where that sits. And that's that's the implication of the, of the and the, the fact that the land use is there. The fact that the land use issues there are being challenged may require the special magistrate proceeding to put up, be put on hold because I don't think the special magistrate is going to be in a position to say that Mr. Underhill should be allowed to do something that he can't do under the comprehensive plan. So that issue would I think would have to be resolved. So so. Would it be, would it be more appropriate to table this until we see the outcome of the, of that? Well, I mean that's always an option to table anything is an option. Yeah, but I think I think from the, the uh, applicant standpoint, certainly he wants to get back in the business. I think Magnolia uh, would probably like to see their the issue well, resolved too. But that's up to you. I'm just what I'm concerned about is if we go ahead and make this decision, and then that lawsuit goes one way or another. Will that impact anything we've we're set in this settlement? Well, if, if we file the counterclaim, then we and we succeed, then Mr. Unhill is going to be under court order to remove all the stuff that he put in. So it sounds like they're counter to each other. Yeah, I mean, one of the resolves and one get eliminates it. Right. It's not. It's, <laughs> neither side's going to win. That's that was my point. Neither side wins if we if we if we go that route. Now, let me ask you on further clarification. So, Mr. Barfield has made a motion that's been seconded that if we agree with his motion, then what exactly happens to... Okay. If you agree... With, if it's, My board mine is to deny the agreement. Right. If the, okay. if the agreement is denied, the lawsuit's going to proceed. Right. Unless it gets withdrawn, which I don't think that's going to happen because if they withdraw it, there's a 30-day limit they had to file it. And then we will file the necessary counterclaim, which will okay. involve the issue of removing everything that was done illegally. And that will go to court. Okay. The special magistrate may or may not want to proceed be until that's resolved. And I, I, my suspicion would be that it would be fruitless to go forward with it until the special magistrate proceeding until that's resolved. So if we vote to defeat Commissioner Barfield's motion and the other three decide that they want to make a motion to accept this, we have to make a second motion. Right. Okay. Okay. So is everybody clear? Yeah. Hey, right. One quick question. Sure. And, and, and I'm just counting by the comments. Uh, I think it's a foregone conclusion at, at, at this point for the vote. Uh, my question is, is if we deny the first motion and then there's a second motion to accept the mitigation agreement, does the lawsuit that is sitting on, or the potential lawsuit that's sitting on your desk then dissolve? Well, I'm, sh I'm not sure that uh, it dis gets dissolved, but certainly you can request that it be we have, dismissed. We have, we have the attorney nodding her head. All righty then. Okay, so on Mr. Barfield's motion, do you guys have that? You're good? Okay, and we have the second by Commissioner Pritchett. All those in favor to deny, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. 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 It fails two to three. Do you need to count who, who voted who? Right. The other three voted against it. Correct. Okay. Now, I will entertain a motion to uh, accept the mitigation agreement, if that's what the board chooses. I'll make a motion to approve the mediation agreement. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Isnardi. Second. We have a second by Commissioner Tobaya. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. It's 3-2. So it's passed.
Now I'm going to um, execute my privilege as chairman to move us up to 6E because I have a little girl here that's been here patiently since 9 o'clock this morning that wants, wants to testify. And so my first speaker will be Emily Oliver. Mr. Chair, let, yes. me, let me introduce the item before okay. the young lady comes up. Um, this is uh, 6E1. 6E1, each year the charter requires that you take uh, recommendations from the citizens that uh, speak to uh, um, improved efficiency and effectiveness of uh, county operations. And so you have this year uh, six recommendations from the citizens, and I think we open that up for a 30-day period um, as required so by your policy. Uh, you have uh, six recommendations. This young lady is uh, coming on the last recommendation, which is from uh, Mrs. Uh, Booth, and it's, it's in the, her recommendation is to eliminate the use or sale of uh, styrofoam products on a uh, public property or by vendors who do business with the county. Okay, welcome. State your name, please. Emily Oliver. Okay, just pull that microphone a little closer to you. There you go. Um, on a lighter note, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, this is an example of what every child in Brevard County eats lunch on. And I have one for Um, I'm here to talk about the negative effects that polystyrene has on our environment and to our bodies. Um, when polystyrene is exposed to heat, it releases chemicals, and then kids in Brevard County go and eat off these trays, which are served with hot lunch, so these kids can develop sicknesses and cancer due to polystyrene. One of these polystyrene trays takes one million years to decompose or longer. And you might be asking yourself, what's a couple of trays in the landfill? Well, I did some research and found out that my school alone uses 50,000 trays in just one year. And in the whole Brevard County, we use 6.1 million trays per year. Imagine the whole state of Florida. To put this in perspective for you, I found out that the tallest building in Florida is, is 789 feet tall, and it's called the Four Seasons Hotel, and it's located in Miami. If we were to stack up all the trays in Brevard County to equal the height of this building, we wouldn't have just one stack of these polystyrene trays, not two stacks, not three, not four, not five but we would have 93 stacks of polystyrene trays that end up in the landfill. Think about that. I didn't just come here to tell you about these trays and not give you a solution. For my fifth grade science fair project, I decided to find two different plates that were better than polystyrene trays that could actually decompose in the landfill. So I used the news, a newsprint plate and the cornstarch plate. The newsprint plate decomposed in about two months, within two months in just my backyard. That's a heck of a lot shorter than a polystyrene tray that takes one million years. It's my hope that the commission will support my resolution to decrease the polystyrene use in schools and businesses around Brevard County. Thank you. And what was your name again? Emily. Emily. That's what I thought. Thank you, Emily. Um, Marsha Boone. Booth. Um, Boone. Booth. Booth. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Marsha Booth. I live in Vieira, Florida. And, um, well, thank you for considering this recommendation. And thank you, Emily, for coming here to talk about it. Um, uh, according to 
um, the World Eco uh, Economy, um, Economy Forum report, uh, report of January 2016, Plastics production, plastic production uh, has increased in the past 50 years uh, from 15 million tons in 1964 to 311 million tons in 2014 and it is expected to double uh, by the, over the next 20 years. The recycling rate for plastics in general is less than 14 percent worldwide. Each year, at least uh, million, 8 million tons of plastic leak into the ocean. And that's the biggest point here with the uh, polystyrene that doesn't go away. It just breaks down in small pieces and it will end up in our oceans. We're talking about Indian River Lagoon and the cleanup and all the trouble that we've been going through. Uh, so this is one of the pollutants. Um, so according to the numbers from this report, um, we're going to end up in 2025, uh, we'll have in the oceans one ton of plastic for every three tons of fish. And by 2050, we'll have more plastic than fish in our waters. So the only way around this is to reduce. Uh, reduce the amount of plastic used for things where a more, more sustainable alternative, alternative exists. Just like Emily was pointing out, uh, even in her school, they changed for uh, the styrofoam trays to paper trays. They called the trailers Tuesday. So one day, and they were able to reduce the amount of styrofoam they're using, and it is going into the, the waste system. Uh, polystyrene is plastic. So polystyrene is a, a type of plastic manufactured from non-renewable fossil fuels and synthetic chemicals. And the expanded polystyrene is what the food containers are made of. Polystyrene foam is light. So the lightweight, because it's mostly 95% 90, is, uh, is air, it just blows everywhere. So it, it, we cannot control it once it is in the system. Polystyrene is toxic. Polystyrene is basically made of fossil fuels and synthetic chemicals, and one of those chemicals uh, is styrene. That in um, it was categorized as reasonably anticipated car uh, car carcinogen by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So why limit uh, polystyrene? Polystyrene is durable and does not degrade and it's difficult and it's costly to recycle if we decided to try that. Uh, the foam breaks easily into tiny pieces making it difficult to clean up. So there's a cost of cleaning up as well. Those small pieces are often uh, ingested and harmful to our health, the health of our wildlife, and the health of our environment as a whole. The real cost of polystyrene containers is a lot higher than the price paid for the containers themselves. Uh, what has been done about it? As of uh, June 2015, over 110 cities and counties have banned polystyrene altogether or partially. Miami Beach is part of the list and uh, just recently Coral Gables joined here in Florida joined the, the list. The Surf Rider Foundation has a list of polystyrene ordinances on their website, all that were approved around the country, the, the country. What can be done in Brevard? So Brevard County is 72 miles long, and almost 35% is water. You have 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, the county could, would greatly benefit from limiting polystyrene and avoiding direct costs in managing that type of waste like the cost for cleanup. Um, based on, on staff comments and in regards to numerous events and vendors, we can expect greatly to reduce the volume of polystyrenes by taking this step. A phase-in approach to, be, uh, to implement such change would be expected. So I hope for unanimous support from the board to move this uh, recommendation forward. Thank you. And Gail Meredith, I don't see her here. I think she left. Okay, that's all the cards I have. Uh, Mr. Tobiah. 
you have a comment on this or that was yeah, before? Mr. Chair, the charter requires uh, that you approve, approve with uh, the options are approve, approve with revisions or reject. Uh, you have a staff report um, in your agenda and so the issue would largely be because uh, Parks and Rec uh, has 238 active agreements and um, approximately 4,700 rentals, it would be a big issue for them. Uh, Mrs. Rotherine has given you issues with regards to purchasing and so whatever you do would be a prospective sort of um, um, uh, uh, look at the issue. Um, and so again, the charter requires you to either approve, approve with revisions or reject. And again, her recommendation is for Brevard County to eliminate the use of uh, styrofoam containers on all public property and by vendors on public property and local government contractors. And I think just to clarify for her that that would be under the board of Brevard County Commissioners. And so I don't think that it would affect the school board just to make that, that clear to you. Commissioner Pritchett. Yeah, I, I don't like these things. We don't buy them in our house either. I, I've tried to buy, avoid styrofoam since I found out when you put hot liquids into it, there's all kinds of really bad things that get released into your body. So um, I, I don't like these at all. I'm probably going to vote to reject it just because I don't think we're ready to do this. But I would like to, to keep visiting this and start encouraging everybody to move over to paper. I think it's a healthier alternative for the environment and, and for us. And the children, I, 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 I did not know they're eating lunches on this every day. So um, I'm going to call the school board when we leave here later and, and uh, throw, throw something to their ear that maybe all the schools can change over to paper. But um, you, I'm sold with you. I, I agree it's terrible for you. I'd like to, for us to get away from styrofoam altogether. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to vote to reject this because I don't think we're ready to do this yet. As a county, it's going to take a little bit of work. But I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Commissioner Barfield. You know, I, I know it's a, it would be a big thing to do, but it would be nice if there was a way we could maybe do some sort of a pilot study, something small, and we could see, you know, and I don't know who would, we should turn that over to, but I'd like to come back with some little pilot study to see what the implications are, you know, if it's going to be a um, major undertaking. But, I mean, there's certain things we could do, you know, you can phase in over uh, your subcontract or contract agreements, you know, there's things you could do to strongly recommend that they go away from styrene, polystyrene. And uh, so I don't know, Mr. Whitten, what can we do along that line? Well, I, I think as the, um, at least on the purchasing side, as the contracts uh, expire or come up for renewal, you could probably um, either address it as a requirement um, to have, to not use um, styrofoam or um, I don't think you can give them any extra credit there. So I think as, uh, as the many contracts that we have come to, uh, to term, that you could probably um, pilot on a number of those. And I so, know it's a cost implication too. Yeah, and, and maybe purchasing can give you a report on um, the likely contracts that are coming up and the ones that would be most appropriate for some sort of pilot study. Because I know it, you look in the lagoon, that's what you see <laughs> all the time. Yep. Um, so what, what do we need to do? I mean, can we... Uh, you need to make a motion to approve with a revision to undertake a pilot study with implications and possibly a phasing in on um, certain or select uh, contracts that are coming to term. Okay. I'd like your input from the board. Would what what y'all think about it? I like it. Commissioner Zanardi? I think it's a great idea. I'm sad to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, but I mean, I don't buy this in my house, and it's not because I'm the perfect individual when it comes to, you know, green use. And But I, I, we're pretty good in our house. But I, I like the idea. I just want to make sure, obviously, that it's not a cost burden to us, but I think that maybe then we're tasked with finding the cheapest paper products that we can get. So I don't know that a lot of it's used, you know, by us here, 
But I'd be willing, I'd be open to anything. And if you ever need any of us to come with you to anything or if we can be of help or, you're obviously a much better speaker than we are on this issue, but we're more than willing to help. My, my um, teenager, well, she's a teenager now, but when she was a little bit younger, she did a pro science fair project on, on reducing, and we, we actually did it on paper, and we, we did some plates and styrofoam versus recyclable and stuff like that. So it was a pretty neat project to see what true biodegradation is, and it's kind of cool. So thank you for sharing. I'd go along with some kind of a pilot program if we could do it um, and phase it in. I know it's a, it's a big, big elephant in the room, but I think it's something that we have to address. If we, if we can address it now, we can start moving the ball forward. I, I spend a lot of time on, on beaches, both on the St. John's River and the Indian River, and yeah, the, there's a lot of this stuff, and it's usually in pieces, and it's, you know, it's not easily picked up. I do a cleanup. Um, four times a year on one of the islands off of Grant for the Keep Brevard Beautiful and we get a lot of this stuff that, and it doesn't take up much room and it doesn't weigh anything but it's all over the place and in my own house when we have these things like egg cartons and whatever we make the effort to save them and recycle them at Publix I don't know what they do with them but I know our own recycling plant doesn't want them so it, we can't recycle it with the county, but I can take it to Publix and dump it in their little bin. So um, if somebody, anybody else has a comment, I would be, I would certainly entertain a motion to get the ball rolling. I, um, one other point, we, when you do a pilot study, you have, usually have an end point too. So I would say a one year pilot study. And um, so I'll make the motion that we uh, have a pilot study done with uh, to come up with some smaller scale uh, reduction or elimination of polystyrene and come back with us with a with a report in one year. Works for me. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Barfield, a second by Commissioner Pritchett. And do you guys need any clarification on wording? We're good. Okay. All those in favor, vote aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes five zero. Hey, Congratulations. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Is it still Tuesday? <laughs> okay, we're going to go to 6C1. Are you going to come back and finish up that item? Yes. Because you got five more. Which? Okay. Under, under 6E1, you have five recommendations. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Just want to get out of here. <laughs> okay, so recommendation number two. So the, the first recommendation really uh, didn't actually come with a recommendation. It was on uh, the TPO website, and uh, really the gentleman had a couple of comments about the TPO website, uh, Babcock Street, um, and certain intersections on Babcock, basically the condition of Babcock Street. I think the Wyoming intersection is one of your approved projects so so that'll be undertaken here shortly so I would suggest that as there was no recommendation that you simply uh, reject that uh, the web page design recommendation okay do we need a motion on that I move to reject it we have a second, second. we have a motion and a second to reject all those in favor of the rejection say aye aye, aye. aye. Passes 5-0. The next uh, recommendation was from Mr. Martin, and it was to hire a full-time sustainability director, and, and the, the role of that person would be to benchmark current activities and accomplishments with an, uh, an eye towards improving uh, the county's performance. Uh, two comments with regards to that, and we've, we've given you, again, the staff report, and we talk a lot about Lean Six Sigma because we really do think that that's the process uh, that is uh, moving us in the appropriate direction in terms of um, performance improvements, efficiencies, and eliminating waste. And again, if you looked at uh, the county's budget book, you will see that each department has a number of performance measurements and it is uh, under the responsibility and the charge of the directors to ensure that they're meeting their uh, performance uh, uh, measurements and so 
I would say that we believe that we have the issue of sustainability, at least with regards to how it's written up by Mr. Martin, addressed under uh, Lean Six Sigma, and again, um, their performance measurements in the county budget book that each department and office director is responsible for ensuring that we meet. Pleasure of the board. Motion to reject. We have, a, second. we have a motion to reject and second. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes 5-0. The third uh, recommendation is to uh, eliminate waste was the title of it. It was the recommendation is basically to put virtually everything out for a competitive bid. You have um, a staff report from Mrs. Camarada. She gives you some examples of the uh, services that are currently outsourced and there's a more extensive list if you uh, if you uh, click on the county's budget office link under the general information section you'll see that the county uh, outsources uh, uh, quite a bit of um, services and products there and so again um, at the pleasure of the board it is to approve reject or approve with revisions but again um, you have uh, the staff report and, and, and we, we believe that we actually uh, outsource and we're, um, we maximize our opportunities for outsourcing and bidding <laughs> items out. Pleasure of the board. Move to reject. We have a move, uh, motion to reject by Commissioner Pritchett. We have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Barfield. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes 5-0. And, I, and along that same line, I would just like to mention that when I'm out in the public, I often get those comments that we should be outsourcing more things. And I knew that we outsourced a lot, but I was really kind of blown away when I saw how much we really do outsource. So if Mr. Berman's taking note here, you might want to make mention of that fact in your article. Next. The fourth um, recommendation is for all organizations to be required to obtain um, a license to uh, operate bingo. You have an exception uh, in your ordinance to the, uh, to the state law and currently that exception exempts organizations and groups that have or, uh, that have or serve 75 players or less per day. And um, that issue has come before the board a number of times and um, you have the staff report, and, and uh, our recommendation would be that uh, you reject this uh, recommendation. <coughs> Pleasure of the board. Motion to reject. Commissioner Znardi makes a motion to reject. Second. Second by Commissioner Pritchett. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes 5-0. And this is the last one as you've uh, addressed the uh, number six. Uh, this recommendation is for um, homeless shelters and soup kitchens in North Brevard. Mr. Uh, Golden has given you a report on the services that are available uh, uh, in particular in North Brevard. You'll see that many of those, um, some of those needs are met through um, various not-for-profit organizations, but he's giving you a pretty good report on what's uh, in the community via not-for-profit organizations. Pleasure of the board. I move to reject, but since it's in uh, my district, I do want to state it's a funding issue, and, and we're all working really hard towards this problem. But I, I just, I just going to move to reject this today. We have a motion by Commissioner Pritchett to reject. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second by Commissioner Isnardi. Anyone wish to vote no? It's rejected. Vote is five zero. Okay, now 6C1. Good afternoon, Commissioners. As a result of Hurricane Matthew, uh, we have resulted in about 40,000 cubic yards of debris in the waterways of Brevard County. And while 
Uh, the county and the cities have been responsible for cleaning up the land-based debris, and we have taken care of that. Um, the state has just begun the project of cleaning up the waterways for which they are responsible. Um, it was funded at about 25% of the cost estimate that they received. They are currently 18% complete with the waterway debris collection in Brevard County, and they are almost out of money, which leaves quite a bit of waterways still having debris in them. And that's not just in Brevard County, but it's in seven other counties that were affected by Hurricane Matthew. What we're requesting is authorization to send a letter to the legislative delegation and to the governor requesting that they do provide the appropriate funding for their state agency so they can complete the project. Pleasure of the board. Made a motion to accept. I'll make a motion to accept it. Um, I thank you for doing this. Um, I think the state needs to step up and take care of the responsibility. So yeah, I support it. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Pritchett and a, a second by Commissioner Barfield to send this letter of. Uh, to the Brevard Legislative Delegation and to the Governor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Passes 5-0 and I will, I will tell you I will do a personal follow-up to our delegation and to the Governor after I'm assuming I'll be signing the letter. I will do that follow-up and I will make the phone call myself. Okay, so I'm not mistaken. Now we're going to get back to 5A. So we've had our presentations by our two top-ranked firms. Comments from the board. Commissioner Pritchett, you have the floor. Okay, um, I, I've got to tell you, if we vote on either one of these, I'm not going to be troubled. I think they're both great companies. Um, I think you guys did a great job. Um, actually, the one company I, I would have liked we didn't even have in the mix, but I'm, I'm very comfortable with these also. At the uh, city level, we used another company that did a great job for us and brought us through a lot of candidates. Um, I probably like um, Mercer Company's cost more. Um, I. I it's, it is. Um, Commissioner Tobias just brought up the, the difference in it, and I, I probably am a lot more comfortable with that. I'm probably a little more comfortable with the other company's um, search ability. She had a whole lot more people she was going to use as a pull to search from. So I'm going to listen to you guys and, and hear what you have. Um, I, I, um, again, I'm not going to be heartbroken with either one that we, we do. Um, but that's just my thought right now, and I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say here. Well, we have a couple of cards, so let's hear what the public has to say. Yes, uh, Pam LaSalle. Pam LaSalle, Vieira. Um, I was opposed to hiring an outside firm, but I went ahead and uh, did what research I could on I, what I have available on the Internet, because I don't have any... Uh, expensive services. I just use what's available uh, for free. Uh, but I did come across some interesting information. I realize this is a very serious position and some of the people that will qualify and be good managers may come with some baggage. But all the same, we need to get someone that we have that we feel that we can trust and is competent. I'm a little alarmed. Uh, I came across an article out of the Palm Beach Post uh, about the Narlock firm. Uh, the headline uh, is Discrimination Claim Against Firm Dogs County Administrator Candidate. It seems one of the six finalists out of 80 applicants for the county administrator position was working at a firm, Westat, which agreed to pay $1.5 million to settle federal discrimination claims that it systemically discriminated against thousands of female and minority job applicants in 2008 and 2009. The prospective administrator candidate's responsibilities at Westat included corporate social responsibility issues and provided overall management in a number of areas, including human resources. 
And while this job candidate provided a positive statement of their abilities in the article, the company they worked for had to pay $1.5 million in back wages and interest to 3,651 applicants and make 113 job offers as positions became available. The settlement occurred several months before the job opening. This is from the article. The six candidates were vetted by the Tallahassee-based consulting firm of S. Renee Narlock and Associates, but two commissioners, Priscilla Taylor and County Mayor Shelley Vanna, said they did not know about Westat's discrimination settlement until told about it by a reporter at the Post. That's also how Ron Davis, the chairman of the Selection Advisory Committee, said he learned of the settlement. Quote, I'm not aware of that, he said, when asked about the Westat settlement. Quote, very interesting. I'm not even sure if my fellow committee members are aware of it. And I feel this information shouldn't come from the media. It should come from whoever is hired to cover it. That wasn't the only problem with this uh, particular incident. Um, they, this company also failed to uh, tally the votes properly and um, in Y'all, they had internal and external candidates. I don't know if that will pertain to y'all. But anyway, um, I, I just don't know if any problems exist with the Mercer Group or not. I didn't come across anything from them. Uh, I found out in the paper that they're the cheaper, though it was mentioned here, here today. Um, I'd like to see us avoid it and do it in-house, but if you're determined, I'd like for you to go with Mercer as they're the more economical choice and at this point um, appears more competent. Thank you. Mr. Tovey. Charles Tovey, 2555 Roberts Road, 32940. Make it short. Um, experience with the EDC, not experience for the EDC. Uh, personally, I'm against any of our people that have worked for economic development. Anyways, it's a conflict of, and they should have experience with the environment and working with the EDC, not from the EDC. And I just wanted to make a clarification on what I heard and thank you for your time and also, <laughs> I do have a, a process with the styrofoam use, and the county jail uses a lot of styrofoam on their little plates of sandwiches they get every day. But I do have a way of cleaning the water with the styrofoam, and it doesn't take as long, it could take that long, but I have a way of proce processing the styrofoam and making it beneficial for the environment and the community as well. It doesn't have to be a bad thing, it just has to be a thing. Thank you for your attention, and. Have a nice day. Okay, so <clears throat> does that clear up anything for my fellow board members? Mr. Tobiah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I want to thank you for uh, sitting on that uh, search group. You know, uh, I didn't vote for a search firm. This would be one of the few times I didn't think it was would be good to outsource. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Visco and Mr. Knox, as, as well as yourself. And uh, we have three uh, competent, intelligent individuals. And I think uh, the decision of the board uh, or that committee, as well as the cost difference, I think, you know, 45 percent is uh, quite large. And I don't know if that means that we're getting a great deal with uh, the Mercer group or, you know, or, you know, Ms. Narlock is, is, is out, outside the realm, but given the two factors of uh, price and uh, the recommendation of the board, uh, it will be my selection to, to move forward with, uh, with the Mercer group. Mr. Barfield. Well, in my business world, we, we have to do a tremendous amount of recruiting of high-end medical people, and I have to say both of them are very, very good. 
I, uh, uh, Mrs. Norlock really nailed it when she, when talking about recruiting method, the best people you find are the ones that are not looking. And that, that's how we do, we go out and we recruit. And, uh, but that said, you look at the, the, the price and I'm gonna end up going with the Mercer group. I mean, they're experienced too, but that's, that's where I'm gonna go. Commissioner Zanardi. Yeah, I was really torn. I mean, after hearing from both, but my gut in the beginning was to go ahead and hire a firm, no, regardless of who this majority decided. But I, I have to trust my HR director and even our county attorney as, as the Mercer Group as their first choice. Um, you've been doing this a long time and I trust your judgment and I think you both are fantastic firms. You both have great reputations. But I mean, obviously, saving the money is a bonus, but if they were evenly priced, I still would go with the first rank firm. Okay, guys, I need a motion. Motion to approve um, the use of Mercer Group for recruitment. Okay, we have a motion candidate. by Commissioner Zanardi to accept the offer by the Mercer Group. We have a second. Second. We have a second by Commissioner Barfield. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. I would like to personally thank the, your group for, for competing and we were very impressed. I was very impressed. Okay, do we have any, I have no, no cards for public comments. <laughs> Board reports. Mr. Witten. Mr. Chairman, I sent you uh, the board uh, information on the budget workshops, and so I, I need for the board to approve uh, workshop dates, budget workshop dates, uh, Tuesday, April 11th at 3 p.m., Thursday, April 27th at 3 p.m., Tuesday, May 9th at 3 p.m., those were the only three dates where all five commissioners were available. Do we need a motion on that or we just need to agree that yeah, this is... Motion this to amend your... Um, okay. Your we need a motion to amend calendar. those to those dates. Motion to amend calendar to include those three budget dates, budget workshop dates. We have a motion by Commissioner Iznardi to accept those three dates. Second. We have a second by Commissioner Pritchett. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes 5-0. Mr. Chair, I also sent to you all a proposed workshop schedule, and that those were divided into six workshops, so you only have three dates. And so we'll have to squeeze down, unless you're going to come up with more dates at a later date. Um, so uh, the workshop schedule, I'll try to compress uh, unless the board wants to give me some uh, uh, additional guidance on that. I also need to know if you want me to invite the charter officers to present to the board. Don't everybody speak at once. As far as dates are concerned, I mean, we were given options, and I think during both sweepings of the large amount of workshop dates, I think I only had one conflict, and that was during the second one. So, I mean, my, my schedule may be a little more open than some, only because of when I do work um, as a nurse, I do it on the weekend, so that doesn't interfere. But maybe what we could do is look at other dates besides Tuesday, Thursdays, and Fridays, because I think that that may be, because it's either Tuesday at 9 or 3, or it's, you know, like I'm sure between all of us, I mean, I've never had this problem before coming up with dates where we could all um, manage to be here. I mean, it was three more dates than what he presented and we passed, so I'm sure we could find something in between. Mr. Witten, your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we looked at uh, dates in addition to uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays and, and, and obviously trying to accommodate all of your uh, personal and uh, work circumstances. And so, you know, if you, if you want to look beyond uh, these dates, we'll continue to do so because I think it's going to be tight. Um, I think I also gave you the calendar um, for budget development. The only thing I, I would say to you, and we'll look for three additional dates, is that normally the process is um, 
um, because not all of the uh, proposals are in until May that um, um, we'll have direction from the board um, prior to May and in May and June the county manager is meeting with everybody to try to come up with a balanced budget proposal and so it'll be a condensed uh, time frame it'll be a new uh, it'll be an interim county manager that's um, that's uh, having to work under that condensed time frame and so I would say just in consideration of those factors that the board work as quickly as they can to come up with uh, three additional dates. If, if can you we, expand if your uh, your your possible days or your to Mondays and Wednesdays or Fridays? I, I can. Or is I, I work for y'all, so we we're good on the dates. It was it's your calendars that. Okay. Well, uh, you but I mean, if someone's working a nine to five, that's fine too. But then we just have the meeting at six thirty. That's what other people do that have full time jobs that serve on. And do councils. we do we have do we have to have all five at the meeting? I mean, you know, if somebody can't make it, we we need to do these. Right. I mean, it's not an option. And you know, as far as the daytime jobs and nighttime jobs. Um, I know when I was a candidate, everybody asked me, are you going to have time to do this job? So if you have a daytime job and you have to not work that day, I think that's what you committed to your constituents, but that's just me. Mr. Witten. Yes, sir. My, uh, the wisdom of my years would say to you that um, it is always preferable to have all of the commissioners okay. there, especially when you're talking about budgets. And so we'll, we'll, we'll go back to the drawing board for three other dates. Do we not have evening meetings for workshops? or Because that's not even an option. We haven't had, had them since I've been here. But is that just not an option for people? Or I know a lot of workshops that I, we would have residents that came to workshops more often than they came to actual commission mm -hmm. meetings at times. I mean, it would be out of the realm of craziness to have it at 6 p.m. if it accommodates somebody else's schedule. Personally, I'm I don't, assuming personally, that somebody I don't like has a I'm, I'm an introvert, guys. When it, when it like gets to be 5 o'clock at night, I'm done with people. 5 or something. I, I, I'm just trying to be accommodating without singling anybody out because I don't know whose schedule it is and I don't mm. care. It's not, you know, everybody wants to do the right thing and that's the compromise. Well, whatever whatever you guys come up with, I'll be there. So, Mr. Witten, pick some days and can I include uh, Saturday? Yeah. No. <laughs> that's my point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean that's well, your point? You want to come in on Saturday? Yeah, we're good. We we just I think Mr. Abate is is ready for the direction, and so, you know, we we'll exclude Saturdays, but we'll look for and and that may give us more possibilities. We'll look for evening opportunities. It just it doesn't have to be at 7 p.m., but like four five ish is not late. I don't know. It's just a thought. Give us, give us, give us the spread, Mr. Witten, and, and we'll just take dates. Sir, I'll give those to you as quickly as possible. One last thing, um, Mr. Chair, I think that you and Commissioner Barfield are not available for the April 6th uh, zoning meeting, and I've been told that um, I won't be. There are two items for District 2, if I'm reading this correctly, and then there are no items for District 4. Oh, I'll be back. He says he'll be back. Yeah. Okay. So then Commissioner Pritchett can run the meeting. This will be fun. <laughs> All right. I had to do it twice when, when I was vice chair. Thank you. And that's the April 6th um, zoning meeting. Okay. Thank you. I'm not shaving my head. Oh, come on. <laughs> Mr. Knox. No report, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barfield. No report. Mr. Tobiah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to uh, get your direction as we move forward with these uh, budget workshops. Uh, uh, will your direction be to look retrospectively at the previous year's budget, or do you expect the uh, departments to have proposed budgets as they come to us? Are we going to look at uh, the quote-unquote green money that, that, that we talked about? 
you know, in the previous budget workshop, uh, I think that it was apparent that uh, you were well prepared. Uh, you know, in previous in previous uh, what, budget what workshops. Basically, I what I did, I did look at past budgets, and and I came up with um, I don't remember now. I don't remember yesterday, um, but it was a year ago, and I think I came up with like two point something million, and then I pared that down to what I, I just threw out what I knew no I couldn't get a, agreements on, and then I came up with I think it was one point three or something like that, of items that I thought I could get some agreement on. So that's how I did it. So, it, so, and I, and I want to be, uh, you know, fully prepared as we go in into this. I think you've put a mandate that uh, roads need to, or infrastructure needs to be a priority. So, if we were to dissect the previous year's budget, uh, specifically uh, uh, looking at a the, the green money and b the uh, non reoccurring, mm -hmm. uh, and focus in on those type of uh, issues. Uh, I mean, obviously, getting rid of the reoccurring first uh, as as savings. The non-reoccurring, obviously, you would hope that it wouldn't show up again. Though, you know, that's certainly not not a given. But that is the type of you know homework that you're charging us with as mm -hmm. we come forward. And and the the next question would be as we uh, meet, um, how best do you want to disseminate this information to our fellow commissioners? I think it might be uh, unfair. If uh, we all walked in and, and dropped our recommendations on our desk prior, do you, do you want yes, that ahead? Mr. Knox, because when I did it, I, I just presented it to the other four commissioners in one of these meetings. Well, it's like all, <clears throat> as long as there's no interaction between board members, you can send out your ideas as to what you would cut, for example. Okay. You can make a list of cuts and say, here's what I'm going to present. As long as. You don't write back saying, "Well, here's what I'm going to, you know, yeah. I'm going to do something different than what you're going to do." Well, that's a great idea. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> but, but my issue is, say you uh, send out a budget, you know, and you think that line item 16 should be cut, and you know, I'm looking at the same department, and I see, based on your recommendation, that I missed that when I went through it, and I think line 16 should also be cut. So when I send out my recommendations, you know, I, I might inadvertently uh, put line 16 had I not put it on prior to you sending me that recommendation. So what I'm worried about is not the first person that sends it out. I'm more worried when it comes to Sunshine about the mm. second person. Not that I agree with you, but, you know, here I'm sending something out that will indicate that I'm under the same, you know, uh, mind, mindset as you are. Just don't tell him. Just. Mr. Witten. Again, you know, first of all, <laughs> you're not going to know what line 16 is and so if you're going to drill down to line item budgets and a justification a question that's asked of the departments and a response from departments then all of the commissioners should have benefit of the question and the response because um, all of the departments are, are, are capable of walking up there and defending their line item budgets based on their expertise based on their needs and here here's the how budgets are made um, state level county government uh, city government until you tell the departments that you're reducing the service level associated with their uh, programs and services their baseline is uh, last year's budget or the budget or the number that allows them to maintain that service level and so you know the academic discussion of zero based budgeting has always been something that uh, that uh, happens more in textbooks than in the real world, and so it's our expectations that departments will walk up uh, before you at the workshops and present their needs. Now they're not going to have a balanced budget proposal because there are so many moving pieces and parts to the budget. You won't even know what your revenue predicament is by the time we get into workshops. And so, and so to say that you're going to take from one area and move to another um, may be a good exercise, but until the sheriff walks in and he tells you what his needs are and you know the effect of the federal budget on uh, CDBG and home, then you know there's just a lot of work uh, that has to be done. And so 
it's my expectation that when we walk up there uh, at the budget workshops, you're basically talking about the green money, and we gave you that form that actually balances out the 220 in revenues versus the 220, uh, 220 million in expenditures. And as you, if you'll notice, the workshops are grouped in those sort of logical areas. And so, as you as you are uh, drilling down, then I think that. Uh, we've given you some some very good uh, logical groupings to look at, and so um, you know the budget, the, the 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 departments will be prepared to defend their line items. Uh, there's an expectation on my part that they will be asked, uh, "What do you? What do? You, what? Why is this line item necessary?" And so we're preparing. Um, to give you a presentation of needs, but also have departments ready to defend um, whether or not uh, a folding machine is necessary in the current fiscal year and will be necessary in the next fiscal year. Commissioner Pritchett. I, I'm thinking as, as we go through this, well, what, on, on what you were just talking about, Mr. Witten, I'm, I'm expecting you guys to run your uh, departments effectively and efficiently. And if not, we probably need to change out department heads so they're doing a better job with that. But I'm expecting that already to be uh, mixed in with the budget as we're moving forward. I think what I'm going to be looking for is if there's some services that we're given right now that I don't think maybe are things that we should be doing right now if we're having a challenging budget period. But I'm still kind of curious of what the revenues are going to be and, and what the uh, millage is going to be and what kind of... Um, funding we're looking at. My hope is we don't have to do any cuts so there'll be adequate revenues. That would be very nice. But I, right now I'm kind of trying to figure out alternative revenues coming in to help us out a little bit too if, if there's anything creative. And I've got a couple ideas I'm going to throw out to y'all um, when we have the next sit down meeting, give you time to think about it. Or if Mr. Knox is comfortable with me sending y'all an email not responding with some things so y'all can think about it. But I'm um, looking forward to, to moving into this. And, you know, once you get going on it, the time just goes by so quickly. And um, so it's a big budget, and you guys have done a great job in the past. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping we've got enough money to move forward and to keep building. We're in such a good time right now. The economy is going good. And I hate even having to talk about cuts. I would like to talk about areas we can, we can grow out as a community and, and start expanding. So I'm hoping we'll get there soon and be able to um, live that kind of county life here watching our funds come through, of course, you know, look, looking over it, be, being able to take on some new county projects to improve our quality of life. So that's my thought. Mr. Witten, that brings up an interesting point from my perspective. When do we know what the CPI index is going to be that we're going to use? I think she's calculating that now. I, th I think she's already said, she being Jill Hayes, the budget director, that we're at a 1.26. And so we'll know that soon enough. We won't know what the property role is uh, until June 1st. The property appraiser sends over the preliminary role and certifies it on July uh, 1st. You know, with regards to roads, uh, remember at the first budget workshop, we talked about the fact that the board has uh, an ability to, to allocate an additional $6 million of one-time funding um, in this current fiscal year. And then in, on a recurring basis, in next fiscal year, you're going to have an additional $1.5 million. And so, and I know there are a lot of things that are said out there about uh, the county's ability to fund the uh, recurring periodic maintenance of roads there. But again, just to reiterate or to remind you that in 2006, prior to 2016, you were only doing eight miles of periodic maintenance. This current fiscal year, because of the additional 1.2, you're doing, um, I think that's 20 miles. And so the proposal is uh, for next fiscal year, because you'll have an additional $1.5 million, is that you're going to get somewhere in between the 20 and 34 miles uh, of uh, the periodic recurring maintenance. And then in 2021, uh, because your uh, communication, uh, your uh, constitutional uh, fuel taxes, uh, the bonds are paid off, you're going to go somewhere between 34 and 61 miles per year. And so this county 
uh, the board has made good progress in terms of prioritizing uh, your road needs. You, you in in a period of five fiscal years, you'll go from eight miles per year to to, to 61 miles per year um, in terms of uh, funding towards roads. The question at the last workshop was asked about uh, refinancing the constitutional uh, gas tax. We actually did that last year. The financial advisor reminded me of that yesterday that we in 2015 we did that um, last year and uh, those bonds have a rate of 1.26. Um, that, that's uh, almost free money. And so you have four more payments of the uh, constitutional uh, gas tax and so um, you know we'll try to bring so if we paid that off we could accelerate that six yeah, million dollars yeah we'll, we'll try to bring Max some creative way to it uh, to advance that my creative way is perhaps an internal loan and you stretch the three years to six years and and then and that way you get an additional 1.5 on top of the 1.5 that you're anticipating as an increase um, <coughs> for next fiscal year and so you know the good and bad of your road situation is is that in uh, five years you'll you'll be at that sort of a, a benchmark of the 55 plus miles per year the big issue has been and will always be the backlog. How do you get a sufficient pot of money um, to address the $500 million in, uh, in needs that uh, we've identified as staff, and you're not going to squeeze that out of the, nope. uh, the 220? Nope. 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 That's not hanging on a tree anywhere, low, low hanging or otherwise. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that. Um, Christine is nardi. Commissioner Twy finished? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll just be brief. And, and thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Mr. Witten. That seemed very, uh, if I didn't know better, I'd think you were running for office. Uh, but uh, looking, I, I watched that uh, presentation too. And it's wonderful that you mentioned that we're spending more. We are. But if you also looked at the bottom of that chart, and I did spend a lot of time with it, you'll see that our need, even though we're spending more, is getting greater yep. each and yep. every year. Yep. That's so though we're, spending more, though, though we're spending more, the gap is getting larger and larger and larger. So yes, tough decisions will need to be made, but placating folks is we're no longer paving eight miles is really sending out false promises to folks. And, and yes, uh, uh, my office has been spending a lot of time, and yes, there is an $1,100 folding machine, but those are the things that I think is incumbent upon us to look at. And I'm sorry that it gets in the way and of, of w whatever, you know, your office is doing, but I honestly do not appreciate uh, uh, notes that, uh, or emails that come out of your office when, when, it, when it is dealing with uh, uh, green money questions. It's a very complicated process. Yes, uh, we've asked lots of questions. But yes, there will be lots of more questions to answer. Um, travel line items are, are good to know. Where and who's traveling is also very important. My office is, is, is doing this. I am more than willing to share this at any time with any of my fellow commissioners. What I'm not willing to do is stop asking the questions that I think are so fundamentally important to us to uh, getting down and, and understanding this. So yes, you know, I may not know what line item 16, but I'm going to make up six, uh, you know, line items and there will be 16 or 26 or 126 and I think we need to uh, look over these in individually and ask those serious questions by uh, decreasing or eliminating what impact will that have on um, our, uh, our constituents. But most importantly, most importantly, I believe we need to ask the questions. And uh, I encourage uh, everyone else, that was very important that the chair put that upon us uh, to go out there and investigate the budget. And I appreciate the uh, leadership that he has taken on that. And, uh, um, you know, according to uh, Sunshine, you know, this all has to be done openly. So the board's discretion uh, it needs to be ha ha happen on an individual basis when it comes to asking, you know, of the questions. But certainly, any any of the uh, 
uh, results that come out will be shared with the rest of the board so we can tackle this uh, very serious uh, matter uh, when it comes to funding, fully funding infrastructure in a way that is going to make our roads quite a bit better. So uh, again, I, I encourage my fellow commissioners to to ask those uh, questions that I'm asking or, or better questions so we all can come in with a uh, robust uh, uh, way at looking at the budget instead of coming into uh, presentations about why a department needs, you know, that to keep the funding at last year's level. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, more knowledge is, is uh, only going to make this process better for all of us. Commissioner Zanardi, board report. I have nothing. Commissioner. Oh, oh. Whoa. I'm sorry, I forgot. I, I did have something. I spent, what, five hours? A little over five hours? I just wanted to thank the sheriff and Paul Elfrey and the pet posse. They raised a boatload of money at their car show this past weekend, over $40,000. Wow. And I think that's pretty amazing. So I just wanted to put a shout out to Paul Elfrey and the sheriff for doing that. That's it. Commissioner Pritchett. Are you going to mention the awards? Sheriff awards? That's what? What? Are you going to mention the Sheriff's Awards? No, you are. Oh, okay. We were able to be at the uh, Sheriff's Awards this past weekend, and I'm really proud of our sheriff de Sheriff's Departments and all the lives they save every year. And good job, guys, if you're hearing me. Yeah, I sent the, the um, Sheriff a, a text right after the awards, and I was just, every time I go to those things, I'm blown away at the dedication, the talent, the courage, um, just he has a, a phenomenal amount of people that work in that in that group, and boy, they step up every single hour of every day to protect us and to serve us, and serve is the key word. And as far as recommending, I'm uh, not recommending, recognizing, um, I want to recognize Garrett Lamp and and the firefighters and all the other people that were involved in the St. Baldrick's Day Shaveathon. And they raised well over $250,000, which just blows my mind that they can do that. But they did it, and they shaved a lot of heads. So I was happy to be part of that. And that's my report, and this meeting is adjourned. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.